Joining me to discuss the legislature's return is House Speaker Scott Bed Bedke, House Minority Leader Ilana Rubel, and Senate President Pro Tem Chuck Winder. Senator Winder, I wanted to start with you and get your reaction to the Senate Minority Leadership Team's concerns. Well, I think there are things that do deserve immediate attention. I think we do need to fund the ability to uh, legally oppose the uh, Biden executive orders, and we want to do that. I think we also have the opportunity to do a memorial to Congress, to, uh, again, expressing our opposition to the uh, mandate. So there are some things that we do need to do, and we are looking at, obviously, uh, another piece or two of legislation that might come up on the Senate side, but uh, we won't know about that. I think as far as a colossal waste of money, uh, I don't necessarily agree with that comment. I think that, you know, the people are very concerned about the president's mandates and vaccinations and that type of thing. And I think we do need uh, to spend some time on that now. Uh, a lot of the other issues that may come up could wait till January, but I think this one's important now. I wanna ask about that legal fund that you brought up. What do you envision this being and how much money are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about establishing a fund of about $2 million and it would be controlled by the legislature through the speaker and the pro tem and distinguish that from the Constitutional Defense Fund, which is actually controlled by the executive branch and by the legislature uh, through the, again, the speaker and the pro tem. And I think the legislature, uh, we saw a good example of this when uh, we tried to join in the case in Georgia and Georgia said, no, we don't want the legislature involved. Uh, we think we ought to be involved and we think we ought to have a position in these cases. So that's what this fund would do. It would allow the speaker and the pro tem to uh, work on those types of issues over the next couple of years. Senator, your caucus had previously said that you thought, as you said, many of these issues can wait until January. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> you've said the same thing. What changed? Well, we were obligated uh, at the end of May to come back. We passed uh, the House Resolution Number 4 that said we needed to come back before the end of the year to close the books. and. Uh, and of course, then that obligated us to take up whatever other business came up in the meantime. So uh, back, and I reviewed the, the debate. I mean, we, if we go back to May, we anticipated another big installment of federal money, probably via the infrastructure bill. Uh, many House members were uncomfortable with uh, kicking that money to the executive branch for, uh, and into their non-cognizable funds appropriation uh, process. And non-cognizable <clears throat> funds, meaning money that comes into the state yeah. that hasn't been appropriated. Exactly. Right. And if the legislature is not there, then the executive branch and uh, Department of Financial Management basically appropriate that. And that is clearly the legislature's responsibility in the in their constitution. And so that, that was the thought process back then. And then since, uh, you know, then we've had the, the Biden executive orders uh, and in the House, uh, the Standing Committee on Ethics has, has a report that is properly, that will be properly before the, the House as well. And that's what we'll take up come Monday. You know, I am looking at the House Ways and Means agenda right now, and it has 29 pieces <clears throat> of draft legislation ranging from litigation funds to state sovereignty to uh, uh, something on the Attorney General defending against litigation on immunizations. How long is this session going to take? And <clears throat> do you anticipate the House taking up all of these drafts? Well, let's talk about uh, the process just a little bit here. So all of these are ideas. If they're introduced in ways and means, then they, then they get a bill number and they're in the public domain but that does not mean that those bills will advance. And uh, so they will be uh, read across the desk at the eighth order of business, inter you know, read for the first time and then assigned to a committee. And, uh, uh, and we'll see how that, that goes, but that the fact that they're introduced certainly does not mean that they will advance. And, and I've been very emphatic with uh, anyone that would listen that, uh, uh, the, the standard by which we should measure their advancement is can this wait until January? If it can, then no. If it can't, then maybe. And we'll go and we'll put that through the, you know, put that bill through the process. As far as the content of these bills, have you told your chairman that there are parameters on what you want them to 
here? Well, I, I, these are the things that, that will guide us. We need to be very aware of the, of the taxpayer money that we're spending. So this needs to happen in a, an efficient, uh, expedited way, but not expedited to the point of short-circuiting the process if a bill does advance. And, uh, and so, number one, the taxpayer's dollars. Number two, can it wait till January? If it can, then, then it needs to be in a holding pattern. You know, we're pretty close to January now. And uh, so, the only things of urgency, things that uh, would allow Idaho to do its prorated share in, uh, as these federal lawsuits advance. And so, uh, those are, the, you know, so have I told them what to do? No, the, the chairman uh, set their own agendas and, and do their own thing. Now, that's not to mean that we don't discuss, but we'll, we'll see. And each one of them, of course, understands the, you know, the urgency here and, the, and, and not wanting to let this thing go too far. I want to get your response. You've had concerns from the beginning, you know, since the the legislature or the House uh, just recessed instead of adjourned sine die. What are your concerns going into next week? Oh, many. Well, I I opposed the, the whole procedure under which we left. Um, I brought a motion to sine <laughs> die, which unfortunately failed, um, and I voted against the resolution saying we had to come back before year's end. Uh, so yeah, n n none of this next week was really the Democrats' idea. Um, but uh, I have a lot of concerns. I mean, you know, I, I don't see why any of this can't wait till January, but I have overarching procedural concerns in that I think we never do very good work under these kind of circumstances. When we come in and say, here's 30 bills, we have to pass them in the next 72 hours, and there won't be any time to get attorney general's opinions, and there won't be any time for people to read them and understand them and for the public to process and come in and testify at hearings. Um, when, when everything, you know, they describe legislation as sausage making, and when you're sausage making at 200 miles an hour where people can't really see what's going into the sausage, I, I don't think you get very good sausage. Um, so I think we would do much better by the public to do it in the more deliberative, ordinary process that can happen when we come back in due course in January, where we have, you know, a couple days between a print hearing and a regular hearing and a few more days till it hits the floor and the business community and workers and everybody have a chance to look at this stuff and come in and have their voice heard and, you know, we don't end up passing things we shouldn't. You say that a lot of these issues or most of these issues or all of them can wait until January, but already there have been employees, especially in Idaho's largest healthcare systems, who have been faced with deadlines to get vaccinated. And a number of them, not the majority, but a, a number of them have opposed those mandates. For them, it is urgent. They're worried about losing their livelihood. Well, with respect to the federal mandates, which I think is a lot of what we're talking about here, I agree with Ayaki and the business community that there just is not a legislative role here. Either the Biden vaccine requirements, which um, at least with respect to OSHA, have a testing alternative. So I don't think they should necessarily be called vaccine mandates because it's vaccine, vac vaccinated or get tested, which is a very different thing. Um, but they don't, first of all, they don't go into effect until January. But secondly, they're being litigated in federal court. Either those are going to be upheld as constitutional, in which case any state legislative attempt to oppose them is probably going to be struck down in court as a violation of the supremacy clause. Um, so in that case, whatever we pass will be useless. Um, if they are struck down, down in court as unconstitutional, they won't be in effect anyway, and there won't be any need for any legislative action. Um, mm -hmm. So any way you cut it, likely whatever we do, given the fact that it is being resolved in federal court, whatever we do as the Idaho State Legislature is either going to be superfluous and useless or illegal and struck down in court in a costly lawsuit. Um, so given that's where we're headed, I just don't see how it makes sense to come in with our hair on fire um, legislating in this incredibly accelerated fashion. Senator, I wanted to get your response to that. Knowing that there are multiple court challenges against these mandates, why not wait? Well, I think that, you know, we've taken the position in the Senate that the real remedy is through the federal courts. Uh, and we still think that. But there are things that we think we can do to fund the defense, to be aggressive in that. Uh, as we look for opportunities, uh, we filed a uh, uh, motion yesterday in the uh, sixth district uh, asking to intervene in that case uh, in, uh, you know, in relation to OSHA. And so we'll see how that all comes about. We, the 
states of, I believe, Texas, and I can't remember who else, in the fifth district received an injunction, and, and so they've actually um, taken that uh, legal step, and the federal court has said, hey, wait a minute, you can't enforce uh, these executive orders, and uh, so, you know, it's playing out, it's just not playing out as fast as the public would like it to. Uh, and so I think when you look at, can we pass some political statements? Yeah, we can but the real remedy is going to be uh, in the courts. And that's, you know, it'll probably go all the way to the Supreme Court. Knowing that you have already signed on to these lawsuits, is it worth spending the taxpayer dollars to come back and make those political statements? Well, I think, you know, we're going to make more than a political statement. I think we're going to make, you know, an actual funding uh, for the legislature to uh, move forward in those uh, actions and be able to, you know, support the legal fees necessary. Uh, the AG and the, and the governor have their own funds that they're moving forward on that side. Uh, we're not in a constitutional defense fund uh, type of case at this point, uh, so those funds are not available, so we do need the funding. Uh, I also think that uh, Congress needs to make a statement, and that's why the memorial would be sent to Congress and the president to ask them to intervene, because they're the ones that should be making these types of decisions. These are political policy uh, legal decisions uh, I don't think they're appropriate for any president uh, to use just an executive order to force someone to take a vaccine. Mr. Speaker, I want to give you the chance to respond to um, the minority party's concerns about whether or not the public and stakeholders are going to have enough time to review these proposals before mm -hmm. they're voted on. What's the timeline like and is the public going to have a chance to read these bills? Uh, the answer to that is yes. They're going to have to pay attention to read them. However, I mean, I think that the, that the senator, ma senator makes a good point. The things we have to do would be, uh, you know, a dedicated litigation fund, a statement, I think, to Congress is in order, and I believe also a concurrent resolution saying that it is the 66th Idaho legislature's uh, you know, decision to participate. We have got to be granted intervener status in front of these courts as this as these go up. And that's going to take, you know, and so, you know, that's going to have to take a, a joint statement. I don't think our friends on the left will uh, endorse that, but, uh, uh, but so be it. And uh, the other, so that was three things. So the other, uh, you know, 26, you know, I, I mean, we'll be in the, they'll be in the public domain and we'll see how the committee process works on them. I think that uh, there'll be ample time, of, you know, having the Senate signal what they would maybe take up and what they wouldn't take up. I think there'll be ample time and those are not complicated bills by anyone's standard. And so uh, I think that the public will, will be able to engage on that. There will be, you know, we'll schedule public hearings uh, and if they're, but we have to suspend rules to do all this. And if the, if the willingness is not there to suspend, I mean, that's a two thirds threshold. And, and then that will bring the, the situation to a stop. A motion I've, uh, to sign it die is always in order. And whenever there's two, whenever there's a simple majority to, that wants to do that, and it is a motion of high precedence. And, so at uh, any point, basically, if somebody says, I move that we adjourn sine die, then you have to take the vote well, right then. Yeah, uh, procedurally, that's, that's the way it works. I mean, we're bow bound by our house rules and our house processes. And so uh, we'll, we'll just have to see how it goes. I'm optimistic, however, uh, with, you know, these, these cases are taking the same track that Obama, the Obamacare cases uh, took, you know, uh, years ago, or several years ago, and they found their way to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court struck down the mandates that were in the, that were in the Obamacare. And I, I believe that this is, you know, this is essentially the same Supreme Court, uh, would that we'd already have those decisions in, we don't, uh, but uh, we'll proceed as if, uh, as if we knew what we were doing, and that includes doing Idaho's fair share in these lawsuits. I want to give you a chance to respond. Sure, actually, the Supreme Court upheld the mandates in Obamacare, uh, and at least the, the, the mandate the that people, uh, the individual, uh, right, and all of the other things in, that they struck correct. down. Yes. The individual <laughs> mandate was upheld. You know, so. But uh, 
Responding to some of that, uh, you know, again, the, the urgency I'm just not seeing, and actually the allocating money to litigation fees, I think, is particularly of concern, uh, because we have already 18 states that have taken on this, this matter to the federal courts. Um, it will be amply, including Idaho, including Idaho's attorney general. Um, so I guess I'm not really understanding why we now need separate counsel hired by the Idaho legislature on top of the lawsuit that is collectively being brought by many, many other states, many, many, many other attorneys. Attorneys General, um, and I'm not understanding again why we have to rush in so that we can layer on an additional level of litigants who are going to be saying the same thing as 18 other parties are already saying in the case um, at considerable taxpayer expense. Um, and this has been a sore point with me for some time because we have lost millions and millions of dollars on these legal funds where I think at least our constitutional defense fund I think hasn't won a case <coughs> since 1996. Um, we are just coming freshly off of losing almost a half million dollars off of the ballot initiative case um, where these legal funds were lost and not just lost through. Well, you have to layer on Bill Meyer's cost, so that was another close to 300000 So <laughs> I think when you add it all up, it was a substantial amount of money. Um, but it is being amply litigated. If you, even if you support opposing the Biden mandates, I think anybody can sleep well at night knowing that there are already armies of perfectly well-paid lawyers who are litigating it, and we do not need to pour in another couple million dollars to uh, add the 19th team of lawyers to litigate that. We know that House members have a number of proposals, including one or two from the minority party. What are the parameters on what the Senate is willing to consider? We have about a minute left. Well, I think we want to deal with the mandates, the executive orders. Uh, we think the other issues that we hear about, we, again, haven't seen the bills. We don't know exactly what's going to come out. We're hearing about an abortion bill or two uh, that may come out. Um, I don't know that we're, while we're all pro-life and we have a very strong pro-life stance, uh, you know, is that appropriate right now? Do we need to do something again uh, when that's actually working its way uh, through the uh, circuit court and towards the Supreme Court and they've agreed to hear a couple of different cases? So, um, you know, where, where do we go? Do we need to do that right now? Uh, they'll use them, you know, as kind of political hammers uh, if you don't support them. Uh, so you're not truly the, the ultra conservative that we are, uh, but I think, you know, if we can keep it at the VAX, we can keep it at the funding, keep it at the litigation, and maybe there'll be a couple of really good ideas that come out uh, that we might consider. But right now we want to keep it to a minimum. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all so much for joining us, and hopefully we won't see you in Boise past Thanksgiving. And thank you for watching. <laughs> we'll have full coverage online, and we'll see you here next week.